On June 27, 2012, a historic event occurred in Washington, D.C. Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi V, may Allah strengthen his hand, met with leading congressmen and senators and other leaders at Capitol Hill. The meeting, the first of its kind, gave an opportunity to some of the most influential leaders in the United States to hear firsthand Islam's message on world peace. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can please be seated. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on all of you. We start our proceedings this morning with the recitation of the Holy Quran with translation by Mulana Azhar Hanif, National Vice President of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا وَمِن كُنُوا كَوَّامِينَ لِلَّهِ شُهَدَاءَ بِالْكِسْتِ وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَعَانُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ اللَّهِ تَعْذِلُوا اعدلوا هو اقرب للتقوى واتقوا الله واتقوا الله ان الله خبير بما تعملون The verse of the Holy Quran, which I have just recited, is from chapter number 5, verse number 9, Surah Al Ma'idah. The translation of this verse is as follows O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in equity, and let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just, that is nearer to righteousness and fear Allah, surely Allah is aware of what you do. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, ever merciful. Beloved Hazur, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome all of you to this special reception in honor of His Holiness Mirza Masrur Ahmad Khalifatul Masih Al Khamis, the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a dynamic, fast growing, international revival movement within Islam. Founded in 1889, it spans over 200 countries with membership exceeding tens of millions. Here in the United States, our community is the first and oldest American Muslim community. We lay our official roots in 1920. What 
distinguishes the Ahmadiyya Muslim community from other Muslim organizations is its deep commitment to the institution of Khilafat, or spiritual successorship. We stand united by a single spiritual Khalifa, or leader. And under the leadership of our current Khalifa, His Holiness, our community has now built over 15,000 mosques, over 500 schools, and over 30 hospitals. It has translated the Holy Quran into 70 languages. It propagates the true teachings of Islam and the message of peace and tolerance through a 24-hour satellite television channel, Muslim Television Ahmadiyya, the internet on alislam.org, and print Islam International Publications. It has been at the forefront of worldwide disaster relief through an independent charitable organization, Humanity First. In many ways, today's historic trip of His Holiness to Capitol Hill marks an important watershed moment in the history of our community in the United States. For over 90 years, our community has been at the forefront of civic engagement. Our Ahmadi Muslim leaders have corresponded with US presidents ranging from Herbert Hoover to Franklin Roosevelt to Gerald Ford to Barack Obama. We have opened the first Muslim mosque in Washington, DC in 1950, and we have published the longest running American Muslim periodical, The Muslim Sunrise. Indeed, under the guidance of its spiritual leaders, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has had and continues to have a significant impact on American-Islamic relations. For today's event, we are delighted to welcome a broad array of dignitaries. This includes members of the United States Congress, both the House and the Senate, members of the Diplomatic Corps, representatives from the White House, the US State Department, members of Uniformed Services, state and local elected officials, thought leaders, faith leaders, NGO leaders, think tank leaders, and professors. I also want to express the Ahmadiyya Muslim community's appreciation to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission and the US Commission on International Religious Freedom for their support. We truly hope you enjoy today's program. And with that brief introduction, let me now invite the Honorable US Senator Robert Casey of Pennsylvania to take the podium, podium to share his remarks. Thank you very much, and I'll be very brief. First of all, I want to express gratitude for the privilege of appearing here in front of Your Holiness and this assemblage. We're really honored you're here. Uh, I was saying earlier that you brought the House and the Senate together. We should have you here more often, <laughs> and we're grateful. Let me say how much I appreciate as well the opportunity to be here with the, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community here in the United States and to be with uh, members of the uh, House of Representatives who have us here today. And I'll be very brief. I have to um, introduce a, a, a two candidates for judge that we've been working on, and they have to be confirmed. And if we don't get them through the committee today, we'll be in big trouble in terms of timing. So I'm, I want to apologize for leaving early. But Your Holiness, I want to thank you for your great leadership, the example and the, the demonstrated commitment that you've shown to tolerance and to justice and to peace. And as a Pennsylvanian, and we're especially grateful that you'll be visiting Pennsylvania as part of your trip, but as a Pennsylvania U.S. Senator, um, I can't help but think of my own history, or the history of our state, and the example of William Penn. When he came across the ocean in the 1600s, he came to found what he called a, a tolerance settlement, a place where religious freedom and diversity could be not just celebrated, but be part of the fabric of what was then just a territory, and now it's become a commonwealth, a state. And we're grateful for that inspiration. And today, on this day, we draw inspiration from you, uh, from your work, and from, from uh, your followers, not only here in the United States, but the world over. God bless you, and thank you. Our next speaker is the Honorable Keith Ellison, 
who is the first Muslim in the United States Congress and serves Minnesota's 5th Congressional District. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. That means just peace be unto you. It's the same thing that, that Jesus might say if, if he were here with us today. Um, but I want to thank your holiness for joining us today and want to welcome you to the Capitol. It certainly is an honor to have you here, and we're all honored by your presence. Uh, I'd like to just point out that uh, it's not in every country in the world that the Ahmadiyya community has been able to operate as freely as they might. This is something I think that is an important thing to point out today because in this world we live in, uh, the fact is, is that there are, there are precious few countries where all the people can practice their faith as they're inspired to, to do so. I can tell you that in America may be the country where it's freest to practice Islam anywhere in the world. And I say that because I know that if we were in Iran, not so easy to be Sunni. If we were in Saudi, not so easy to be Shia. If we were in Pakistan, very difficult to be Ahmadiyya. And there, I could run right on down the list, but in America, all seek the divine as they choose. Different ways to be Muslim, all Muslim. Different ways to be Christian, many denominations, many ways to be Jewish, many approaches, and it goes on and on and on. So I just want to let you know that we're honored by your presence, very proud of our commitment to religious tolerance in the United States, and we believe that though we may be among the most diverse countries in the history of the world, we have a great degree of, of uh, stability and, and, and acceptance when it comes to religious inclusion. I also want to thank you, Your Holiness, again, because under your leadership and inspiration, the Ahmadiyya community has been a true blessing to its neighbors here in the United States. It was only a few months ago that I sat down in the Cannon Building and uh, rolled up my sleeve so that I could give some blood, and I know many of my colleagues did the same thing, uh, in a program called Muslims for Life, and this was a blood drive uh, on, and, and on September 11th uh, that uh, the Ahmadiyya community sponsored. But it's not only that. The community has been building schools, been being a true asset to, to the community here in the United States, I want to thank you, and I also want to thank my colleagues from the House of Representatives, too numerous to mention. That's a good problem. Uh, but uh, but I, I think that by our strong presence here today, what we're saying to you is we value religious diversity, we value the Ahmadiyya community, and we value your leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Ellison. Our next speaker is the Honorable Brad Sherman one of our event hosts and representative of California's 27th district. I invite him to the podium. Thank you. Let me put this down here. Hello, I'm Brad Sherman from California's best name city, Sherman Oaks. <laughs> it is an honor to be here Salamu alaikum. I want to welcome His Holiness uh, Hazrat Mir, Mirza Masroor Ahmad, the worldwide spiritual leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to our nation's capital. I know that this is his, his first time to visit Congress, and I think we're all honored to be here with him. Today we recognize His Holiness's commitment to world peace, to brotherhood, to justice, and to religious freedom. I've inter interacted with many of the Ahmadi uh, uh, followers, both in California and uh, here in Washington, D.C., and I'm only struck by their dedication to peace and to justice and the respect and admiration for the spiritual leader of their community. And I'm pleased uh, to join with so many leaders in the House of Representatives uh, in uh, introducing a resolution today 
on the House floor to uh, recognize uh, His Holiness's uh, visit to the United States. It's a pleasure to be with uh, Katrina Lanto Sweat, who I've worked with for such a long time. And I had the honor to uh, work with her father, Tom Lantos, and I know how proud he would be of her leadership, not only of the Ta Tom Lantos Human Rights uh, Commission, but also the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. And I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge and thank uh, two of my friends from Los Angeles, Dr. As uh, Asif uh, Moham Mahmoud, uh, who's been such an energetic leader uh, of the community uh, in Los Angeles and has worked so hard to make this event a success. And also, of course, uh, uh, Kareem Ahmed uh, for all of his community activities and his work on today's event. Um, the uh, um, Amaria community was, uh, I'm told, founded scarcely more than a hundred years ago in 1889. It has grown to have tens of thousands of, support, of uh, adherents here in the United States and tens of millions around the world. It is a community that has been a model for community service, for religious tolerance in both word and deed, as has been mentioned before and as I had a chance to discuss uh, with His Holiness uh, in a meeting uh, that several of us did uh, before these uh, the, this uh, larger reception, um, his decision to have Muslims for Life uh, honor the victims uh, of September 11, 2001 by collecting 12,000 units of blood demonstrated uh, a dedication to life and also a, um, a respect for what happened to this country on September 11th that I think all of us, uh, all of us respect. Um, there's only one thing that could bring me great, greater joy than to welcome His Holiness to Washington, D.C. in our capital, and that, of course, would be to welcome him to Los Angeles. And uh, Mike, yes, and uh, some of my other friends from California would think that maybe uh, a side trip to Northern California could also be accomplished as a lesser important uh, <laughs> part of his visit to our state. Um, the uh, Ahmadi uh, community's motto, love for all, hatred for none, I think speaks volumes about uh, the community's commitment to tolerance, to dialogue, and to harmony. Uh, it is uh, traditional and appropriate that uh, uh, a few gifts be given to a, a visitor. Uh, one of the uh, things I was a the members of Congress are able to do is to get a flag that has flown over the Capitol in Washington, D.C., and to give it to a, uh, a man of great holiness who has honored us by his presence. And I would like to give you this flag. Not everybody here in Washington trusts what I say. Some will wonder how His Holiness can be sure that that flag actually flew over the Capitol. His Holiness himself is a man of faith, and I'm sure he has faith, but for doubters in the audience, I also brought a certificate of authenticity to restore faith to those with doubts. Uh, I've also brought some uh, special cufflinks for her. Uh, for His Holiness, I, I thank you for, for this opportunity. Our next speaker is the Honorable Dr. Katrina Lantos Sweat, Chairperson of the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom. I invite her to the podium to share her remarks. Thank you so much. It is truly a great honor and pleasure to be here. I have to say that there is a particular sense of blessing that seems to rest on this uh, brimming room today, and I'm sure that that's due in part to the wonderful spirit of goodwill, the warm hearts, and the sense of optimism and love of the participants. But Your Holiness, it is undoubtedly a reflection of the blessing that you bring to this capital, and so we are so honored and so grateful to have you here. 
Speaking for all my USERF colleagues, and I want to recognize my very distinguished colleague, Aziz al Hebri, who serves with me on um, USERF, um, I am delighted to join members of Congress, His Holiness, and our gracious Ahmadiyya hosts here in our nation's capital. Soon you will hear His Holiness speak about his vision of peace and freedom among peoples and nations. This has been the Ahmadiyya message since its founding in 1889, well over a century ago. Indeed, when it comes to freedom of religion, there is unmistakable evidence that without freedom, there can be no peace. Nations which fail to protect the right to religious freedom fail to achieve peace within their own borders. All too often, they experience hatred and strife, violence and instability. In many of these countries, people have almost no idea what it's like to feel safe, secure, and truly free to live out their beliefs in peace as their conscience leads. Today, nearly 70% of the world's people live in such nations. This includes millions of members of the Ahmadiyya community. Since 1974, Pakistan's constitution has labeled all Ahmadiyya non-Muslims. For more than a quarter century, Pakistan's government has barred the community from calling its own worship centers mosques, from publicly uttering the traditional Islamic greeting, or quoting from the Quran, and from displaying Islam's basic affirmation. Throughout Pakistan, Ahmadiyya are prohibited from sharing their faith with others, or publishing or disseminating their own material. They are restricted from building houses of worship and holding public gatherings. And since they must register as non-Muslims to vote, Ahmadiyya, who insist they are Muslims as they surely are, are effectively disenfranchised. Coupled with Pakistan's blasphemy laws, which affect every faith community, these laws have helped foster a climate of violence against Ahmadiyya members. The terrible attack on Lahore mosques in May of 2010 was but one example. But sadly, Pakistan isn't the only country which violates the freedom of religion for Ahmadiyya. In Indonesia, since June of 2008, the government has seriously limited Ahmadiyya activity to private worship and prohibited members from telling others about their faith. Since that time, at least 50 Ahmadiyya mosques have been vandalized and 36 mosques and meeting places shut down. In parts of East and West Java and elsewhere, extremists pressure local officials to close places of worship or ban Ahmadiyya activity altogether. In Saudi Arabia, Ahmadiyya members have been deported for their beliefs. In Egypt, they have been charged under its blasphemy laws. In 2010, I'm proud to say that USERF's intervention helped a number of members leave Egypt for safety abroad. Now let's be clear. The message of the Ahmadiyya community is a positive call for world harmony and liberty. It points beyond today's sufferings to tomorrow's hopes and dreams. Nonetheless, if we are to stand for these principles, we who believe in peace and freedom dare not be silent. We must take a stand for those who face persecution wherever and whenever it occurs. So, what can we do? First, we must realize that the same societies that violate the religious freedom of the Ahmadiyya also abuse the rights of others. As USERF has documented, where Ahmadiyya suffer, Hindus and Christians, Sikhs and Baha'is, Shia and other Muslims often are persecuted as well. Second, in order to protect the rights of all, including the Ahmadiyya, and foster peaceful, stable societies, we who are in Washington must make religious freedom a truly compelling foreign policy priority woven into every aspect of our relationships with other countries. Finally, the United States government should specifically confront governments which target the Ahmadiyya. It should urge Pakistan to amend its constitution and rescind all anti-Ahmadiyya laws. 
It should urge Indonesia to overturn its 2008 decree and all provincial bans against Ahmadiyya religious practice. It should press both governments to investigate acts of violence thoroughly and prosecute perpetrators vigorously. And until Pakistan proves itself to be serious about reform, Yusuf believes that it does qualify as a country of particular concern. Speaking for the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, let me conclude by saying that we will continue to stand for the right of people everywhere to think as they please, believe or not believe as they wish, peacefully practice their beliefs and express them publicly without fear or intimidation. We are proud to stand with the Ahmadiyya community and proclaim together that these and other freedoms are the birthright of humanity. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is the Honorable Frank Wolf, who is a representative of Virginia's 10th District and also co-chairman of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. I invite him to the podium to share his remarks. Well, on behalf of the Tom Lantos uh, Human Rights Commission, I want to welcome your holiness here. And I uh, want to say I want to thank uh, the Ahmadiyya community, uh, particularly here in the United States, but around the world. We know, and I think uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Katrina uh, uh, Sweat Lantos explained the degree of difficulties that the Ahmadiyyas have had. We've seen the pictures of uh, the mosque where they were killed in, in Pakistan. We know they have a very difficult time in Egypt. They have a very difficult time in other, other countries. I want to particularly thank the community, the Ahmadiyya community, for supporting uh, the bill that I have that passed the House overwhelmingly, 400 and some to about 20, that sets up a special envoy to advocate for religious minorities in the Middle East. That bill passed, and it passed with the support of the Ahmadiyya community here. And lastly, to welcome His Holiness here and to thank the community and to thank you for the strong support the Ahmadiyya community has given to this, but also not only given to this special envoy bill, but has always been there. Every time there's a group advocating for human rights and religious freedom, the Ahmadiyya community has always been there, and I thank you and welcome you. I wanted to uh, welcome the Democratic leader of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, invite her to the stage. Our next speaker is the Honorable Mike Honda, representative of California's 15th district. Assalamu alaikum. I want to welcome uh, His Holiness uh, to Washington, D.C. and Thank you for visiting us. And um, last night I had the honor to meet His Holiness at the Hamadiya uh, Muslim Community Mosque in Maryland. It was a wonderful conversation that we had about the power of education, the role of peace, and the diplomacy of the U.S. foreign policy in promoting a peaceful and patriotic Islam. And I just want to mention uh, how proud we are to have uh, Keith Ellison, our first uh, Muslim American, representing um, his state and his district in the most um, diplomatic and powerful way that uh, I think that we would all like to see all of our members do. And he's no stranger to um, criticisms or misinformation, but he's very adept at handling it all and turning it around to his, his, own, um, his own advantage. And I uh, just want to let His Holiness know that uh, we have a voice uh, with him and with Congressman Andre Carson. 
And this is the history and this is the uh, promise of this country that all can participate in this uh, wonderful government. Um, and there are millions of uh, Ahmadi Muslims that are part of the great American fabric. Uh, Ahmadi Muslims are teachers, doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and women who are focused on building the stronger communities, like my dear friend Muhammad Chaudhry, who is the president of Silicon Valley Education Foundation. Where are you, Chaudhry? Uh, he must be out. There you are. And uh, he's also the national vice president of the Ahmadiyya Youth Group, the MKA, which I'm wearing the scarf as I promised. I think that we would like to, since you're vice chair, that uh, we should bring the youth group to the West Coast and uh, do the things that they are doing here on the East Coast. And so uh, I know that they will bring the same message of peace that was uh, mentioned in 1908 that was last written uh, by the work of the, the Promised Messiah for the Ahmadiyya Harat Ministra Gulam Ahmad. And he stated that the earth created by God provides a common floor for all people alike. And the sun, moon, and the many stars are a source of radiance and provide many other benefits to all alike. Uh, this quote resonates deeply with me as someone who served in the Peace Corps, as someone who spent my lifetime as a classroom teacher, but also as a person who had experienced discrimination and the setting aside of the, of the Constitution solely because of what I look like. And so the plight and the fight and the the kind of uphill battle that uh, the Ahmadiyya um, Muslim community is facing worldwide, I hope that you find the, um, the safe harbor in our country for the young people so that they can develop their leadership skills throughout our country and to provide that kind of leadership not only towards the country but to, to the rest of the world so that they can bring the message of peace, freedom, and harmony led by His Holiness. Thank you very much for joining us in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before proceeding to the special presentation of a resolution, I wanted to acknowledge the presence of many uh, members of Congress who are here. Um, uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, Congresswoman Janice Hahn, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, Congressman Gary Peters, uh, Congressman Howard Berman, Congressman Gene Schmidt, Congressman Chris Murphy, and also with us is the former Virginia Governor Tim Kaine. That's, I almost forgot, I have it here written, and the Honorable Laura Richardson as well. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming, and there's many, many others as well. I'm seeing so many. Congressman Franks just sat down. I acknowledge him as well. And there are several others. If I forget, forget anyone, uh, we welcome all of you to this proceeding. We now uh, switch to the presentation of a special congressional resolution honoring Hazur, His Holiness's visit, and I invite Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren to do so. Well, thank you uh, so much. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm pleased uh, to welcome His Holiness on this historic visit to the United States. I'm introducing an official House resolution today welcoming His Holiness. Very large numbers of my colleagues have co-sponsored this resolution, including, I think, all of the members of Congress who are here with us this morning. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community, as we know, was founded over 100 years ago, and your long advocacy for human rights and protection for religious minorities is well known. The community has millions of members all across the globe. It builds mosques, hospitals, and schools, and started an international charity organization focused on disaster relief. Despite persecution directed at this community, His Holiness has urged moderation, restraint, and nonviolence. I understand that in a few minutes, he will deliver a keynote address on the path to peace, just relations between nations. But before he does, we wish to commend his commitment to peace, 
justice, and humanity, and offer a sincere welcome to His Holiness and a copy of the resolution of the House of Representatives that we are introducing this very day. I also wanted, wanted to acknowledge several other members of Congress uh, who have come here, uh, Representative Judy Chu, and also um, we have um, several other members um, who came earlier, Congressman Ted Poe, uh, Senator Cornyn, uh, several members of con Congress who are still to come as well. It is now my distinct honor to introduce our next speaker, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi. Representative of California's 8th District and current Democratic leader of the U.S. House of Representatives. In 2007, Leader Pelosi became the first female Speaker of the House, a position she held until 2011. Leader Pelosi is the highest ranking female politician in American history and has been... <clears throat> And she has been described as, quote, an extraordinary leader for the American people by our President Barack Obama. I invite Leader Pelosi to the podium to share her remarks. Good morning, Your Holiness, my colleagues. I'm so proud to be part of a very strong bipartisan welcome to you, Your Holiness, to the Capitol very proud of Congresswoman Lofgren's resolution uh, to formalize that welcome. I thank Abjan Khan, the National Director of Public Affairs, where'd you go, there, <laughs> of, 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 for your leadership and your kind introduction. Dr. Zafar, welcome to you as well. And it's always an honor for us to be with Katrina Lantos-Sweat, who brings to this event and to her work a great family tradition of protecting religious freedom and human rights throughout the world. I want to thank my friend Kareem Ahmed for introducing me uh, to the community and to uh, his uh, making me much more aware of the work of His Holiness and the leadership. Uh, we're very blessed in America with a large population of Muslim Americans. People from time to time say to me, there are more Muslims in America than there are in Qatar, for example. And I said, well, there are more Muslims in America than there are Episcopalians in America. Uh, and so just to give an idea of the strength of this community and what it means, and I'm very blessed in my district that I represent in San Francisco. Uh, and so recognizing that contribution, when I was elected speaker, uh, just within a matter of days, we had our first meeting and uh, I asked our newest member and first Muslim American, uh, Keith Ellison, uh, to uh, do the opening prayer. It was our first prayer under a new majority and he honored us with his beautiful prayer and our members were very inspired by that and have been ever since. Since then, he has doubled the number of American, uh, by 100%, he has increased the number of Muslim Americans in the Congress, <laughs> with Congressman Carson, <laughs> more to be done. But again, it is an honor to welcome you, Your Holiness, and I want to say uh, it's an honor because you are a man, though of humble beginnings, your leadership has made you a figure of global prominence. Uh, you started as a teacher, and you have become a guide for millions of Muslims worldwide. You work to help farmers in Ghana, that humble task, uh, and you remain a force for progress across borders and advocate for investment in the developing world. You have been prosecuted for your, persecuted for your beliefs, jailed for your faith, and exiled from your homeland, but you refuse to turn to bitterness or vengeance, and that is a very important lesson. Instead, uh, His Holiness has emerged as a leader of wisdom and compassion, a champion of nonviolence among nations and respect among faiths. 
His Holiness and this community have had the courage to condemn terrorism no matter where uh, it, uh, or who perpetrates it, not simply because you were victims of violence uh, yourselves, but because terror is wrong wherever and whenever it occurs. You have spoken out against violence of intolerance, even among fellow Muslims, not only because you have endured persecution firsthand, but because calling for the destruction of churches and synagogues or other houses of worship is a violation of basic human rights. You have taken your campaign for understanding across our country, and thank you for doing that, serving as voices for moderation and the drive for peace. This community has, has done that. Uh, you have demonstrated clear and unwavering the community here and I, as I say, my introduction has been uh, through my friend Kareem Ahmed, uh, but I know from him that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been a force demonstrating, demonstrating clear and unwavering loyalty to the United States. <clears throat> Again, promoting life in our community, blood drives, you're part of the community, and saving lives. These messages and actions reflect the strength of this community and its commitment to our common humanity. And you do this not because all of the people, Your Holiness, the, the Ahmadiyya community does this, not because all of the people that you serve are Muslim. You do this because you are Muslim. And that is your value system. To promote peace and pursue justice, to support human rights and secure the common good, to respect and, and, and the, the dignity of fellow human beings, to embrace and build a society noted for, uh, rooted in equality, founded on pluralism, shaped and strengthened by our beautiful diversity. These principles rest at the core of American life and success. They are critical, unbreakable threads in the fabric of American history and progress. Together, by striving to live up to those values, we can strive to realize the hopes of His Holiness, that the peace of the world comes to be established before our very eyes. As we greet you on Capitol Hill, we take heed of your clarion call to action that, quote, we must all endeavor to spread love, affection, and a sense of community. From the halls of Congress to the neighborhoods across our country to communities around the globe, uh, we must all remain dedicated to the mission of peace and to the cause of justice. We must strengthen our nation and our world through love and understanding. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership role, for your being such a visionary, such an inspiration. It is an honor to be in the same room with you. Thank you for bringing us all together to honor you and for the work that you have led us in to build a better future. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you, Your Holiness. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Leader Pelosi. Our next speaker, uh, is Dr. Hassan al Zafar, the current president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA, who will introduce to us our keynote speaker, His Holiness Mirza Masrur Ahmad. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Speaker Pelosi. Well, leader Pelosi now, but I always remember that part. Yeah. Members of the Senate and Congress, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to pass the podium on to Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, who is the fifth caliph or successor of the Messiah Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani alayhi salam as was mentioned from about 1889 when he declared his claim. We are a worldwide community in almost 200 countries in the world. Our numbers are small, our resources are limited, 
but it is the grace which is brought by his leadership that we are able to do things in a much larger scale and a much more effective fashion than would happen otherwise. The message that we carry is that if you are being hurt, do not respond with hurt, respond with prayers, respond with persuasion, and we have demonstrated again under his guidance throughout the world, especially in Pakistan, where most of the Ahmadis who are here, they came from. He taught us that humanity, a human being, is the fundamental source of respect for all of us and actually for anyone in this world. And we serve humanity not because they have our faith, but because they are human beings. And these things are being done in Africa, where we are providing the resources for education, for health care, and for basic human needs, such as clean water. Now we started with some solar electrical, electrical supplies as well on a limited scale. But the effects are grand because of the benefit of his leadership and the inspiration he provides us. And that is what keeps us going as members, and I think that is what is the, is the dominant part of you know, how we are successful in, in so many different uh, locations. And I, with that, I will stop and I'll let him do the presentation because that's what the value really is. Thank you. Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad Khalifatul Masih Al Khamis. Aslam, please be seated. Rahim, in the name of Allah, the gracious, ever merciful. <clears throat> All distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. <clears throat> Before proceeding, I would like to first of all take this opportunity to thank you all for taking time to come and listen to what I have to say. <clears throat> I have been requested to speak about a subject that is extremely vast and wide-ranging. It has many different aspects, and therefore it is not possible for me to cover all of them in the short time available. And the subject that I have been asked to speak about is the uh, establishment of world peace. Certainly, this is the most vital and pressing issue facing the world today. However, as the time is limited, I will only briefly give the Islamic viewpoint on the establishment of peace through just and equal relations between nations. The truth is that peace and justice are inseparable. You cannot have one without the other. And certainly, this principle is something that all wise and intelligent people understand leaving aside those people who are determined to create disorder in the world. No one can ever claim that in any society, country, or even the entire world, there can be disorder or a lack of peace 
where justice and fair dealing exists. Nevertheless, we find that in many parts of the world, disorder and a lack of peace are prevalent. Such disorder is visible both internally within countries and extreme, uh, externally in terms of the relations between various nations. Such disorder and strife exists even though all governments claim to make policies that are based on justice. And all claim that the establishment of peace is their primary objective. Yet, in general, there is little doubt that restlessness and anxiety is increasing in the world. And so disorder is spreading. This clearly proves that somewhere along the line, the requirements of justice are not being fulfilled. Therefore, there is an urgent need to try and end inequality wherever and whenever it exists. And so, as the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, I would like to make a few observations about the need for and the ways to achieve peace based on justice. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is purely religious community. It is our firm belief that the Messiah and Reformer who was destined to appear in this age and enlighten the world as to Islam's true teachings has indeed arrived. We believe that the founder of our community, Hurt Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadian, was that very promised Messiah and Reformer, and thus we have accepted him. He presses upon his followers to act and propagate the real and true teachings of Islam that are based on the Holy Quran. Therefore, everything that I will say in relation to establishing peace and in relation to conducting just international relations will be based on Quranic teachings. In relation to achieving world peace, all of you regularly express your opinions and indeed make great efforts. Your creative and intelligent minds allow you to present great ideas, plans, and indeed a vision of peace. Thus, this issue does not require me to speak from a worldly or political perspective. But instead, my entire focus will be on how to establish peace based on religion. And for this purpose, I shall, as I have earlier said, present some very important guidelines based on the teachings of the Holy Quran. It is important to always remember that human knowledge and intellect is not perfect, but is in fact limited. Thus, when making decisions or forming thoughts, often certain factors enter human minds which can cloud judgment and lead to a person trying to fulfill his own rights. Ultimately, this can lead to an unjust outcome and decision being made. However, God's, laws, God's law, law is uh, perfect, and so no vested interests or unfair provenance exist. This is because God only desires for the good 
and betterment of his creation. And therefore, his law is based entirely on justice. The day the people of the world come to recognize and understand this crucial point will be the day that the foundation for true and everlasting peace will be laid. Otherwise, we continue to find that although efforts are endlessly made to establish world peace, yet they are unable to provide any worthwhile results. After the conclusion of the First World War, the leaders of certain countries desired for good and peaceful relations between all nations in future. Thus, in an effort to achieve world peace, the League of Nations was formed. Its principal aim was to, uh, to maintain world peace and to prevent future wars from breaking out. Unfortunately, the rules of the League and resolutions it passed had certain flaws and weaknesses. And so they did not properly protect the rights of all peoples and all nations equally. Hence, as a result of the inequalities that existed, long-term peace could not prevail. The efforts of League failed, and this led directly to World War II. We are all aware of the unparalleled destruction and devastation that ensued where around 75 million people globally lost their lives, many of whom were innocent civilians. That, uh, that war should have been more than enough to open the eyes of the world. It should have been a means to developing wise policies that granted all parties their due rights, based on justice and thus proved to be a means of establishing peace in the world. The world's go governments at, the, at uh, the time did endeavor to some extent to try and establish peace and hence the United Nations was established. However, it soon became quite apparent that the noble and overarching objective underpinning the United Nations could not be fulfilled. Indeed, today, certain governments quite openly make statements that prove its failure. What does Islam say in relation to international relations that are based on justice? and so a means of establishing peace. <clears throat> the Holy Quran, um, in the Holy Quran, God Almighty has made it clear that whilst our nationalities, our ethnic backgrounds act as a means of identity, they do not entitle or validate any form of superiority of any kind. The Quran thus makes clear that all people are born equal. Furthermore, in the final sermon ever delivered by the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, he instructed all Muslims to always remember that an Arab is not superior to a non-Arab, and nor is a non-Arab superior to an Arab. And he taught that a white person is not superior to a black person, and nor is a black person superior to a white person. Thus, it is clear teaching of Islam that the people of all nationalities and all races are equal. It is also made clear that all people should be granted equal rights without any discrimination 
or prejudice. This is the key and golden principle that lays the foundation for harmony between different groups and nations and for the establishment of peace. However, today we find that there is division and separation between powerful and weaker nations. For example, in the United Nations, we find that there is a distinction made between certain countries. Thus, in the Security Council, there are some permanent members and some non-permanent members. This division has proved to be an internal source of anxiety and frustration, and thus we regularly hear reports of certain countries protesting against this inequality. Islam teaches absolute justice and equality in all matters, and so we find another very crucial guideline in chapter 5, verse 3 of the Holy Quran. In this verse, it states that to fully comply with the requirements of justice, it is necessary to treat even those people who go beyond all limits in their hatred and enmity with fairness and equity. And the Quran teaches that when wherever and whoever counsels you towards goodness and virtue, you should accept it. And wherever and whoever counsels you towards sinful or unjust behavior, you should reject it. A question that naturally arises is that, what is the standard of justice required by Islam? In chapter 4 verse 136, the Holy Quran states that even if you have to testify against yourself or your parents or your most loved ones, then you must do so in order to uphold justice and to uphold the truth. Powerful and rich countries should not usurp the rights of the poor and weaker countries in an effort to preserve their own rights. And nor should they deal with the poorer nations in an unjust fashion. On the other hand, the poor and weaker nations should not seek to inflict harm on the powerful or wealthy nations whenever the opportunity arises. Instead, both sides should endeavor to fully abide by the principles of justice, and indeed this is a matter of crucial importance in maintain, uh, maintaining peaceful relations between countries. Another requirement for peace between nations based on justice is given in chapter 15 of the Holy Quran in verse 59, where it states that no party should ever look enviously at the resources and wealth of others. And similarly, no country should seek to uh, unjustly appropriate or take over the resources of another country on the false pretext of trying to assist or support them. Thus, on the basis of providing technical expertise, governments should not take advantage of other nations by making unjust trade deals or contracts. And similarly, on the basis of providing expertise or existence uh, or assistance, governments should not try to take control of the natural resources or assets of the developing nations. Where less educated people or governments need to be taught how to properly utilize their natural resources, then this should be done. Then nations and governments should always seek to serve and help those less fortunate. However, such service should not be rendered with an aim of achieving national or political benefits or as a means to fulfill vested interests. 
we find that in the past six, uh, in the past six or seven decades, the United Nations has launched many programs or foundations aiming to help the poor countries to progress. Towards this effort, they have explored the natural resources of the developing nations. However, despite these efforts, none of the poorer nation countries have reached this stage or level of the developed nations. One reason for this is certainly wide-ranging corruption by many of the governments of those underdeveloped countries. With regret, though, I must say that despite this as a means to further their own interests, the developed nations have continued to deal with such governments. Trade deals, international aid, and business contracts have continued to be processed. And as a result, the frustration and restlessness of the poor and deprived segments of society have continued to increase, and this has led to rebellion and internal disorder within those countries. The poor people of the developing countries have become so frustrated that they have turned against not only their own leaders, but also the big powers as well. <clears throat> this has played into the uh, hands of the extremist groups who have taken advantage of the frustrations and so have been able to encourage such people towards joining their groups and supporting their hate-filled ideology. And the ultimate result of this has been that the peace of the world has been destroyed. Thus, Islam has drawn our attention to various means for peace. It requires absolute justice. It requires truthful testimony to always be given. It requires that our glances are not cast enviously in the direction of the wealth of others. And it requires that the developed nations put aside their own Western interests and instead help and serve the less developed and poorer nations with a truly selfless attitude and spirit. If all of these factors are observed, then true peace will be established. If, despite all these aforementioned measures, any country transgresses all limits and attacks another country and seeks to unjustly take control of its resources, then other countries should certainly take measures to stop such cruelty. But they should always act with justice when doing so. The circumstances for taking action based on Islamic teachings are detailed in the Holy Quran in chapter 49, where it says, it, it teaches that where two nations are in dispute and this leads to war, then other governments should strongly counsel them towards dialogue and diplomacy so that they can come to an agreement and reconciliation on the basis of a negotiated settlement. However, if one of the parties does not accept the terms of agreement and wages war, then other countries should unite together and fight to stop that aggressor. When the aggressive nations, uh, nation is defeated and, they agree, and uh, he agrees to mutual negotiation, then all parties should work together and agreement, uh, uh, should work towards an agreement which leads to long-standing peace and reconciliation. Harsh and unjust conditions should not be enforced that lead to the 
hands of any nation being tied because in the long term that will lead to restlessness which will ferment and spread and the result of such restlessness will be further uh, disorder in circumstances where a third party government seeks to bring about reconciliation between two parties then it should act with sincerity and total impartiality and this impartiality should remain even if one of the parties speaks against it and so the third party should display no anger in such circumstances and should seek no revenge or act in any unfair manner all parties should be aff afforded their due rights thus for the requirements of justice to be fulfilled it is essential that the countries who neg who are negotiating a settlement should themselves not seek to fulfill their own personal interests or to try and derive benefit unduly from either country they should not interfere unjustly or pressure either of the parties unfairly the natural resources of any country should not be taken advantage of unnecessary and unfair restrictions should not be placed upon such countries because this is neither just and nor can it ever prove to be a source of improving relations between countries due to time constraints i have mentioned these points only very briefly in short if we desire peace to be established in the world then we must leave aside our personal and national interests for the greater good and instead we must establish mutual relations that are based entirely on justice otherwise you might agree with me some of you due to the uh, alliances blocks may be formed in future or even i can say they have started forming it is not unlikely that disorder will continue to increase in the world which will ultimately lead to a huge destruction the effects of such devastation and warfare will surely last for many generations and so the united states as the world's largest power should play its role in acting with true justice and with such good in intentions as i have described if it does so then we the and then the world will always remember with great admir admiration your great efforts it is my prayer that this becomes a reality thank you very much thank you again according to our tradition at the end of the function we normally do silent prayer so i will do the silent prayer the amadis will follow me and all of you our guests can pray in their own way please silent prayer After the event, a special guided tour of Capitol Hill was provided. Concluding this extraordinary day was a resolution introduced in Congress and sponsored by 19 congressional leaders highlighting Hazor's visit to the halls of Congress 
and recognizing his commitment to peace.